All right, Dr. Stoller, I think we can um, get started right now. Okay, great. Thank you. Can you hear me, Kirsty? And uh, can, if everyone, uh, everyone can hear me, just let me know. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to our uh, ongoing uh, COVID lecture on urology. Uh, as uh, someone who's been at UCSF for over 30 years uh, in urology, one of the biggest issues is uh, pattern recognition. And a lot of our patients that are referred to us uh, are referred to us with an alleged x-ray. And it's so common that either the primary care person, the family practice, the ER, they look at a report and they don't look at the x-rays. And I believe that as surgeons, before we do anything, both to make the diagnosis and to make a plan for a surgical approach, uh, it is critical to be able to uh, look at the x-rays yourself, appreciate the pattern recognition, and then to be able to formulate an appropriate plan for surgical intervention. It is lucky that you've all picked the field of urology, doing this for you know over 35 years. Every clinic that I have, I continue to see things that I have never seen before. And I think that's one of the things that's so exciting for all of us so that when we come to work, there's something uh, that we will learn and something that will be able to help others. In these situations, you don't want to miss a diagnosis based on something that you have never seen before or worse, if you've seen it before and you don't recognize it. So it's this pattern recognition. So based on those issues, what I'd like to go do is to go through a variety of x-rays here to give you my perspective of how we should be looking at the x-rays. And it's important to be able to have a wide breadth of differential diagnoses because if you don't think about them, then you won't make the diagnosis. People are being sent to you because you are the expert in the urologic systems or urinary systems. And as such, if you don't have a broad uh, differential, it is likely that you will miss some of the diagnoses as you move forward. Let's use the background of the first picture to give an example. This is an individual who uh, came to San Francisco who was immunocompromised from a variety of uh, issues, and he was having hematuria. We all know that hematuria has the classic differential of a urothelial carcinoma, of trauma, of a kidney stone. And those are the most common that you see, but you need to be thinking of other differentials to be able to make you appreciate other types of diagnoses. In this HIV pa positive patient, one would have to think of other opportunistic type things. And when you look at the retrograde pilogram here, you will see that there are nice smooth edges here and then it becomes a little ratty here. And the question is what could this be and what is the best way to approach these things? So the differential diagnosis here could be a, a blood clot, it could be uh, papillary uh, necrosis. It could be foreign bodies. It could be a radiolucent stone. It could be other forms of infectious etiologies like tuberculosis. It could be some kind of fungal infection. Uh, and when, when we think about this wide differential, you want to really seriously think about what are the implications. So in this situation, since they were immunocompromised, I think something like a fungal bezoar would be high on my list looking at someone like this. And the only way to really make that diagnosis is to either look up there or to go in there percutaneously to try to remove whatever this uh, filling defect is uh, within the collecting system. Let's see how we go next. So, when we went up there, this is the tissue that we were able to remove. You can see that it sort of looks tenacious. It looks yellowish. 
it does not look like Canada, which is a fungal infection that more looks more like a dandelion. And when you go up there and look at it with a ureteroscope or when you go in there percutaneously, it just blows away. And as quickly as you see it, it will irrigate out. In this situation, the tissue that you're seeing here is something that had to be removed to the forcep uh, and pulled out. And despite our best efforts, it was very difficult to get this out. When you look at this underneath uh, the microscope, you will see that there are hyphae all through here and that the hyphae appear to be maintained within the collecting system and out here in the renal parenchyma, everything appears to be preserved. So as such, uh, this is a classic example of a fungal bezoar. The problem is, how do you get rid of all of this tissue? And if I go back two slides, you'll see that all of this is very adherent uh, to the mucosa and it doesn't just come off easily like using a peanut to be able to pull it off. It is very uh, adherent. And as such, uh, uh, the best way to deal with these is to go in there percutaneously. After the procedure, you can irrigate them with sodium bicarbonate to be able to get the stuff out. Uh, and you have to deal with their immunocompromised status. If they're diabetic, get their diabetes under control. If they have other uh, immunosuppression from chemotherapy, you wanna try to stop that, see if they get better. Many times with aspergillosis, it's very difficult to completely eliminate the fungal infection. And there have been a variety of situations where we've had to remove the kidney uh, to eliminate this continued fungal infection. Doing a nephrectomy, whether it was open or whether we do it laparoscopically, is actually relatively easy in comparison to when you're inside the collecting system and seeing this inherent stuff that is causing a lots of their problems. So a new differential for you when you think of people with filling defects in addition to stones and blood clots and tumors would have to be fungal bezoars that should be uh, on your list, especially if someone is uh, immunocompromised. Um, here's another uh, film of uh, someone coming in with, again, blood in their urine. And here you can, when you look at these KUBs, you wanna look at it very critically. You'll, you'll see, you wanna look at the bones in a systematic fashion. You wanna look at the transverse processes, especially if you have a trauma case, where that could be an issue of hurting uh, the renal hilum. So you wanna see if there's any broken bones. You wanna look at the area where the kidney is and the kidney should be living somewhere around here. You can see an edge here of the spleen down here and you can see the bowel gas. But if you look at it carefully, you can see what appears to be a very sharp demarcation of a subtle line coming in this area that appears to be involving the collecting system of the kidney. Now you can't say for sure, but that could be a diagnosis. It is unlikely that this would be a calcium oxalate or a calcium phosphate stone. Those are a lot more dense and have a mineral density or a Hounsfield unit in the eight, 900 range. When you get Hounsfield units lower than that, you do need to be thinking about uh, uric acid stones uh, or, or matrix stones or non-stones because we don't know that this could be a tumor when, when you take a look at that. But when it involves the entire collecting system with no evidence of uh, intravenous or retrograde contrast injected, uh, you need to think about a potentially radiolucent stone. So here is a retrograde pilogram in the same individual. And here you can sort of see that there are these smooth, important to say smooth, involving the entire collecting system. In contrast to the previous case, where you saw sort of this ratty stuff along the edge of the collecting system and not involving the center of the collecting system, there's a difference. One is a fungus. And in this situation, on this next film, here you can sort of see it uh, with the drainage of the retrograde pilogram. And then this is what the tissue looks like when you remove it, if you were to go in there percutaneously. This is a classic <clears throat> matrix type stone. Matrix stones do not fragment with shockwave lithotripsy. 
Matrix stones don't crack with laser lithotripsy. Uh, matrix stones are difficult to remove with a variety of lithotrites that we use for percutaneous nephilophotomy, like the Trilogy, the Cyber One, or whatever. The best way to remove this tenacious matrix type stone is to grab it with a forcep, twist it, and pull it out through a percutaneous access. You can try this through a ureteroscope, but I think that you'll get so frustrated that you won't be able to make any substantive uh, uh, progress in removing all of these stones. We need to remember that stones are in part biomineral and in part matrix. The biomineral is now thought to all start with a calcium phosphate stone. And typically at the tip, of the renal papilla, and as they grow, they will have heterogeneous nucleation. We have calcium phosphate with calcium oxalate on top of it, and those will be your classic uh, uh, calcium-based stones. In matrix stones, in contrast to the traditional stone being anywhere between three and six percent matrix, these are ninety to a hundred percent matrix or ninety ninety percent matrix. And we need to understand what causes this proteinaceous material that is the, for, that is the foundation for many forms of stone formation. And one can think about it like a bone. And when you have a broken bone, you have the osteoid, and the osteoid then becomes mineralized. In a similar fashion, whatever is causing the secretion of these proteins, if one could address that issue, one may be able to better address the etiology of calcium-based urinary stones. Now, when you look at this under the microscope, you can sort of see these circumferential rings, just like a tree that comes all the way around. And what you'll notice is that the dark blue area are the biominerals. And so these are biominerals here. There's a biomineral here. There's biomineral here. There's some bile mineral uh, down here. And so they grow like rings. And if you take a regular stone and embed that in epoxy and cut it with a diamond uh, a saw, you'll see these same kind of rings that come in these sequential type of uh, growth patterns, just, just like a tree. And as a result, you see a rhythm in the body and you see the rhythm on how these stones are actually being formed. And this is a good way of understanding how stones form. But this is a classic matrix stone that is soft. You need to realize that the Hounsfield units on a CT scan would be very low. These are not amenable to shockwave. They're not amenable to uh, laser lithotripsy. And they typically are not even good at breaking up and sucking out with uh, a, a typical lithotrites that we use for urinary stone disease. So, so far, we've looked at an aspergillus growth within the collecting system uh, of uh, the renal pelvis. Uh, we've looked at uh, a matrix stone here, similar type of uh, situations, but completely different pathophysiological processes. When you think of recurrent stones, uh, matrix stones do not have a higher stone recurrence rate compared to biomineralized calcium phosphate or calcium oxalate stones. Uh, when we look at x-rays, it is important to look at the bony structures before you look at anything. So whenever you get an x-ray, you need to look at the scout radiograph before you look anything else. And I see that Yi, uh, Dr. Dr. Yi Lee is on the line. Yi, give me your differential on what you see on this scout radiograph. Well, just describe what you see. So uh, I see a radiograph. I see the pelvic brim, um, pelvic bone. So I think we're looking at the pelvis. Yeah. Um, the area where I expect there to be the bladder. Um, I guess sort of I, up in this area here. Yeah, where your mouse is. Yeah. I guess, I guess I can see uh, a little, a, a darker area where there's less enhancement. Yeah. Um, but I'm not entirely sure what else I'm finding. So, so, so the preface, Dr. Lee, is that I uh, talked about bones. How do the bones look to you? 
so the bones is not something that I look at very often. Which... That's why I, that's why I put this in here. So you've got to look at the bones. If you miss the bones, you're, you're going to miss out. Yeah, so uh, I think probably on the, the pubic rami here, it does look a little more spotty and a little less homogenous than I would expect. It almost, it almost looks mothing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so what, what's your differential on mothing bones? Um, maybe some sort of calcium reabsorption issue. Such as? Such as hyperparathyroidism. Okay. So tell me about uh, hyperparathyroidism. In a classically, you make the diagnosis when you look at a wrist or the skull, and there's subperiosteal radiolucency. And so you'll see an edge right underneath the subperiosteum, and there'll be like a lucent area underneath here. And that's classically seen on a wrist film or a skull film. And so it's unusual to see those kind of findings in the pelvis, but it's a good differential, but that's not what I'm looking for. Continue with your differential. Um, Why are you doing this to me, he's saying? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, so, Just give me, one more, give me one more differential. That's all I'm asking. What else besides, what else can kind of bone resorption uh, in this moth-eaten appearance that if you see it once, you don't want to miss it again. What could, what else could this be? I mean, I'm thinking maybe some kind of malignancy related. Um... Okay, so it could be a lytic malignancy, right? So it could be. All right, but this is Paget's disease. Oh, okay. yeah. So, you know, when you see this sort of moth-eaten appearance of uh, the pubic rami or other bones that can be seen anywhere, you should think of Paget's disease. So I'm just throwing out a little area there to keep everybody on their toes and uh, we'll go from there. We'll move on to the next one, Yi. Okay. So let me see. We have Dominique on. Dominique, how are you this morning? Hi. Well, hi, you. Dominique. What are we seeing here? This patient came in and you want to do some uh, 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 imaging. Um, all right, so this looks like um, a view of someone's retina through an ophthalmoscope. Okay. Um, I think that the vessels look okay. Um, and then kind of on the left of screen, there are these. What, what, what's this sun over here? What is this area? <laughs> That's where the optic nerve goes in? Right? When you look at in your retina, right? It, yes, exactly. Yeah. So what, what's this area here? Well, what's going on here? So it looks like there's some calcifications. Uh-huh. Good. And why would a urologist be worried about some retinal picture here on a patient? Um, I guess kind of maybe similar to what we were talking about before with, with issues with calcium uh, uh, metabolism and... Um, maybe these calcium deposits could possibly kind of be similar to sort of calcium deposits elsewhere or like a nephrocalcinosis type thing. Good. I love that, Dominique. So, uh, so this is a stone patient, and this is a stone patient with what we call primary hyperoxaluria, where it's a genetic defect where there's a variety of enzymes. I'm not going to go into the names that you don't need to know off the top of your head, but there are different types of primary hyperoxaluria types 1, 2, and 4. These people have high levels of oxalate, and when you get a KUB, and maybe I should have some x-rays next time to show you all the different manifestations of primary hyperoxaluria, and it looks like a nephrogram phase on a KUB or a CT. It's like, when did you give the contrast? Well, I didn't give any contrast, okay? And so with primary hyperoxaluria, they will get these calcifications, and you can see them in here, uh, in the retina. If this whole area was moved here on top of the optic nerve, the person would go completely blind. So right now, their vision is okay. But if this was just moved over one or two millimeters, this person would completely lose their vision. So these are extra renal bowel minerals from primary hyperoxaluria. So there's two types of primary hyperoxaluria. There's endogenous, which we're talking the primary, and there is uh, the type of elevated urinary oxalate from a bowel issue. So when you have that, you could think of someone who has the classic inflammatory bowel disease. There's increased fat. There's increased bile within the gut. That will then bind with calcium to make a soap. 
a saponification process. And as such, the oxalate is free to be readily absorbed and they become hyperoxaluric. The way you would treat this person if they had enteric hyperoxaluria is to give something to bind the oxalate like calcium. So for people who have primary hyperoxaluria, you have to be able to treat them with some of these new RNAi inhibitors that are experimental. When it gets severe, they require both a kidney and a liver transplant because if you don't go to put a new liver in, the production of oxalate will continue and there will be some problems down the line. It, those are quite rare. At UCSF, we maybe have about a dozen of those cases. The more common one, maybe every other clinic, you will have an enteric hyperoxaluria. In those people, you want to give them milk. You want to give them something that will bind the oxalate. One of the best things is to give them tums. And they can chew tums with the calcium uh, 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 gluconate, like calcium carbonate. So tums is calcium carbonate that's poorly absorbed, and that will bind to the oxalate to be able to uh, uh, have them poop out the oxalate rather than absorb it. So this is an unusual presentation of primary hyperoxaluria. And in those situations, you need to get an ophthalmologic exam. In a similar fashion, if you had a fungal infection, you would want to be sure that their eyes were cleared. Got it, Dominique? Any questions? Nope, I got it. Thank you. Okay, sounds good. Um, I saw uh, Avi Baskin on the line there. Avi, what do you see here on this x-ray? So we have a tiny film x-ray. Um, yeah, I'm looking at the spines and the spine and rib, it all looks okay. And the spinous process and transverse processes. I see coming kind of the calcification. So it's very important always to look at these transverse processes. Sometimes this area here can be confused with a ureteral stone. I'm just sort of saying out that. Go ahead. I see on uh, the patient's left side there is a uh, few calcified, like a big calcified kind of egg-shaped material now could potentially be near the kidney uh, based on the location of the rib, or the ribs right there. Um, uh, so that's kind of piques my interest. Okay, I'm going to give the next slide to Dr. Yang since he's an expert on these things. Dr. Yang, what do you see here? Hi, Dr. Stoller. Uh, Hi. So I see several series of images from a coronal CT scan, looks like with contrast. Um, looking through the abnormality that jumps out to me is the left kidney. Um, I don't see great parenchyma. Um, and I'm looking at this rim enhancing sort of fluid collection. I don't know now, Doctor Yang, you don't know that it's is that you don't know you don't know if that's. Um, let me see here. You don't know whether it's rim enhancing, Heiko, because oh. you don't know what the scalp looked like, right? Sorry, Doctor Stoll. Actually, I, I missed <laughs> I missed what you just said. Can you? Yeah, you don't know whether that's rim enhancing because you only have the one film. So you really need to compare this to the pre-contrast images. Got it. Right, but it could be. What, what's this up here? Uh, that looks like the adrenal gland. Okay, good, all right. How is this different from the case that you did yesterday? Oh, well, uh, it looks like it has nice clean, so for context, yesterday we did a uh, very difficult uh, XGP, uh, nephrectomy for an XGP kidney that had been previously operated on, operated on and had like, you know, multiple drains and just a mess. But uh, this kidney looks, uh, in terms of the plane surrounding uh, the kidney, it looks much cleaner uh, and it's very distinct. All right, let me give you the next picture to give you some help on this. Does this look like yesterday's case? Uh, the fibrinous stuff in the, you know. How about the guacamole here? Yeah, that looks about the same. Right, right. Made from the same, made, made by the same restaurant. 
Exactly. So what is it when it looks like that greenish type stuff? Well, what, what do you make of that? Do you have to be more careful when you remove these kidneys? Uh, yes, in terms of, you, you know, you, you still want to make sure that your anat anatomic plane, um, well, your dissection is still safe and, you know, the planes are usually indistinct. But in terms of seeing that, um, usually when you, I, I think my reading was if you culture the, the exudate, um, usually it's sterile. All you see is uh, like the foamy macrophages and no organisms, uh, if, especially if they've been pre-treated, uh, which our patient yesterday. So the, uh, the, fo the foamy macrophages are in the parenchyma. They're yeah. not in the exudate, correct? Exudate. So if you have xanthogranulomatous pyelonephritis, the foamy macrophages, which is a good test question, is in the parenchyma. It's not in the exudate or in, in the purulent uh, fluid. Mm. This this was actually done by, I forgot the guy's name, Morris B or something like that about 30 years ago. I picked that out for Avi so, so that he could maybe talk to his dad about this. Uh, but this was a tuberculosis kidney. Okay, so that, that would be the differential of yesterday's case. Um, yesterday's case, I think it was just an infectious etiology, but tuberculosis, burnt out TB could look like this also. Okay, so we'll have to sort of see what the, uh, that guy did not have tuberculosis yesterday, right? Uh not yet. Not yet. Okay. So good. All right. And the, the planes yesterday, do you think that you got into the kidney when you saw all that green stuff? Or you think that you got, you think that's just the, how the kidney was? Uh, there's, there's no question we uh, poked into the kidney. Okay. All right. Sounds good. <laughs> um, I'm trying to see who else I have here that I can ask a quick question. Max, you're there real quick. Uh, Max, uh, this is a, a stone that Maya took out not that long ago. Maya, hello. Uh, wh what's your diagnosis here and why? Mm, well, it is a kidney stone. Um, how, do, how, do you, how do you know it's a kidney stone? <laughs> well, it, so you told me, but um, also, okay. um, it, it, you know, it has the classic appearance of a, ki of a kidney stone um, where it's, you know, sort of this rounded shape. You can see that just kind of sitting in the renal pelvis or in one of the calyces. It has all these kind of little, you know, bumpy spots, which is kind of, you know, what we see uh, in, in, in kidney stones. Um, right. Grossly. Okay, so uh, give me the types of stones that you've got that are available that would be on your list. Well, calcium oxalate being the most common kidney stone. Um, uh, there's also uh, calcium phosphate kidney stones, uh, uric acid kidney stones. There's uh, cysteine kidney stones. Um, there's kind of a whole list. Um, those are kind well, of let's, 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 wait, wait, wait. When you say a whole list, let's go through the list because if you don't have a list, you'll never remember it. And Chris is sure. going to be on board to help you with your list, right, Chris? Okay, so you said that there's calcium oxalate, there's calcium yes. phosphate, yes. uric acid, yes. cysteine. Yes. Let's go around. Just tell me some more differentials of what other type of stones there are. Okay. Um, it, uh, there are some less common ones that we learn about, or more common ones. There's uh, calcium apatite stones um, are another. Calcium uh, apatite is what kind of stone? So ca calcium about, phosphate, I believe, right? So calcium phosphate yeah. is two types. It's yeah. either... Uh, Appetite stone or a brushite stone, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, appetite stone will have a urine pH above 6.4, whereas if it's less than 6.4, it will be a brushite stone. Okay, so appetite has a high pH, a brushite stone has a lower pH. They are both calcium phosphate stones. Um, there's also xanthine stones, which are less common, um, but we do learn about them, and they're often on our in-service exams, it seems. Okay. Um, there uh, are some uh, uh, stones, I can't remember which uh, antiretroviral medication it is, but it leads to a stone. Um, all, all the protease uh, inhibitors, like in Dinavir, and that for your test question, those would be the only stones that do not light up on a non-contrast CT. So if you get a non-contrast CT, and there's no stones, and they're not on a protease inhibitor, you can look at them in the eye and say, you do not have any stones, mm -hmm. period, okay? And those are usually the people in days past that would come in that said that they would be allergic to IV contrast or something to that effect, okay? So they don't want to have an x-ray, they're looking, uh, seeking drugs or whatever it might be. So all stones will be visible on non-contrast CT except for the protease inhibitor stones. Amira, there was a case that we did yesterday that uh, the lady was taking some medication, so it was on the differential for the stone. Do you remember that one? Yeah, she was taking topiramate. 
Yeah, so Topamax, right, for her seizures. So that's a classic uh, a medication that can result in a, a urinary stone. Uh, any other stones anyone could uh, chirp it with? Any, uh, any antihypertensives uh, that you can think of that cause uh, uh, stone like triamterene stones, you know, part of hytrin. So triamterene stones, so that you want to look at their medications if they're having recurrent stones. So if you want to get them off the Topamax, get them off uh, a variety of drugs. Sulfa, Septra can cause stones. I've seen Lasix can cause stones. Uh, so you just want to look at the variety of medications and see if there's a temporal relationship with that. Uh, so this stone is a cysteine stone. It has that amber color. There are two types of stones that have been mentioned in the literature, the smooth cysteine stones and the rough. This would be more of a rough type where it's, uh, some of them are very, very smooth on the outside. And this was uh, described uh, by the Boston group maybe 20 years ago that some were resistant to shockwave and some were not. Most people would think today that most cysteine stones are not amenable to shockwave lithotripsy in general. So unless you really are forced to do something, probably I would not do a shockwave lithotripsy on a cysteine stone unless I was really pushed to do it. Uh, that for some reason, the homogeneity of these stones make them difficult to be able to fragment these stones. Um, Cysteine stones are, you know, a defect in the SLC3A1 or 79 gene. You know, we have a, just to put a little plug in for it, we are having an ongoing uh, trial looking at an alpha lipoic acid for cysteine stones. So any cysteine stones need to come to Dr. Chi and myself to include them in this prospective trial. Let's see. I don't know if I showed this one before. I probably did. Uh, who's at the county right now? Anybody online? I think county team might be busy right now, Dr. Stoller. Okay, what do you see here real quick? You've been at the county. Uh, so I see um, pieces of what appear to be stone next to a ruler. So I assume that it was uh, like a removed specimen. Right. Um, this might be a, like a calcium asphalt stone. Uh, it looks kind of cementy with gravel, but but the, I'm not sure that that's a real diagnosis. Yeah, this guy likes to, uh, to drink paint. So to see the paint on this side here. So this is a guy who was in the prison uh, at the general. He was going to go down for uh, sentencing, and he said he's, he's having stones. He was passing this. He was just chipping these off the wall of the cell. And you're right, it does look asphalt or cement-like, and so. It's not a real stone, but he was trying to make it look like, so it sort of looks realistic, but it's not all that different. Okay. Okay. Um, Mira, tell me what you see here. Uh, so this looks like it's a KUB that was done. Um, just looking at the bones, it looks like there is some uh, curvature of the spine. It doesn't look completely straight to me. This is sort of something they got back pain here, huh? Yeah, maybe just their positioning or if they have some sort of scoliosis there. Um, and then kind of in the area where I would expect the bladder to be, it looks like there's some, some contrast there that's filling. And then I see potentially some contrast going up on the left side. It looks very faint kind of uh, near one of the spinous processes. Um, but I don't see it kind of going anywhere down. How do you know it's going? Well, how do you know it's going up versus down here? Help me out. I, I actually don't know that. That's true. Um, I don't see any type of um, instrumentation in the bladder suggesting that we're doing a retrograde. So I don't see like a urethral catheter in place. Ureteral catheter in place. Just looking for other things there. Um, so it could be a you know an, an IV pilogram that was done. What, what's an IV pilogram? I know you guys haven't seen many IVPs. Yeah, so um, basically you give a, an IV injection. I think it's two milligrams per kilogram, um, and then you wait 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes, and then you take a plane shot um, like this, and then you should be able to see the collecting system uh, of both the kidneys. So it's a, it's a poor man's way of uh, doing a retrograde pilogram, and that's what we used to do in the past. Uh, so you think that you see sort of a, a pilo collecting system here? 
coming yeah, on down. Very safe, though. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not seeing anything on the other side. So, so why would that? Why would that be? So it could be that there so is. So this could be also a scalp film after IV contrast with a CT scan, right? So that would be a, a contemporary type of film that you'd see like this. It's true. So reasons why you wouldn't see it on the uh, on the right side would be one potentially there is no kidney and collecting system on that side. Okay, um, good. I like so that. Do you see any clips there or anything like that? I don't. So it'd have to have been a clipless nephrectomy, which I don't think that exists. So. Well, you know, but I mean, even if you had a stapler, you know, you, you know, GIA staplers sometimes they're hard to see, but it's possible. Okay. Um, more likely, there are two other options. Are one, it's a there's a delay on that side, so the contrast isn't coming down the the kidney uh, through the collecting system on that side. So we could potentially see that if there was. So you have delayed excretion. Give me your differential for delayed excretion from the kidney from whatever kind of study that you have. Sure. So um, it could be that the kidney is just non-functional at baseline. So someone has like an atrophic kidney that just doesn't you know filter anything and so that's why we're not seeing any contrast on that side um we often will see it in terms of uh, kidney stones um so if there's some sort of obstruction like that that causes there to be a delayed nephrogram on that side um you see, are, any stone, you see any stones there i i don't but that would probably be the most common cause that we see in the emergency room right yes okay what else could it be so you're sort of saying there's a problem that it's a dead kidney or there's bad uh, drainage? Right, or that we've intubated the, <laughs> the left side and actually put contrast on that side, and that's why we're not seeing it on the right side. Okay, but we don't see any films here, but yeah, that, you'd have to have the history of how the contrast was administered. Mm -hmm. What else could it be? Um... Dr. Uh, Bud, Bud Burnett was giving a talk about some of these things uh, uh, last week. Hmm. What are some of the predispositions to getting uh, uh, priapism? Oh, sickle cell disease? You get sickle cells. What happens with sickle cell uh, if you have a delayed uh, excretion of the kidney? Um, why? <coughs> I don't know if I, I don't think I know the answer to that actually. So it could be a thrombotic event, so renal vein thrombosis, right? So okay. a sickler could present with acute renal vein thrombosis. So that's definitely on your differential, right? If you don't see anything on that kidney, it could be that there's no drainage of the kidney because of a stone, a tumor, a clip, or some iatrogenic you know, disaster. It could be that there is not good drainage of the venous system for a variety of reasons, the most common being renal vein thrombosis and the most common of that would be someone who is African-American, like our talk earlier before this came in, or if uh, you had sickle cell disease, correct? Mm -hmm. What yeah. else could it be? Um, so when we take a kidney out, what do we, what do we clip? The hilum. Okay, and what's in the hilum? Uh, the, uh, the ureter, the vein, and the artery. Okay, I guess the ureter, we'll put the ureter in the hilum. But you typically, when we say hilum, it's just the vessels. Uh, uh, Carissa gets excited when you say that the ureter's in the hilum. But, uh, okay, so we've talked about the vein. We've talked about the ureter. What can cause the artery to become obstructed? You, you could also drain trauma. Sometimes we see a thrombosis as well as the artery. Okay. So uh, what, when you, if you suspect someone has a thrombosed artery to the kidney, what should you be thinking about? Um, like if they need to go to, in, if you think about like interventional radiology or something like that for an angiogram to assess the flow to that kidney. You could do that. But before, if you were going to do that, the interventional radiologist said, you know, we're busy right now or we're at Mission Bay like over the weekend. And they're going to sort of say, well, you know, we'll get there in an hour or two. To help convince them, what would you do? I know with Zoom, we don't examine people anymore. But if you could examine someone, what would you, what would you want to examine them for? Uh, well, in general, we are usually looking at their flank. <laughs> so okay. interesting that you'd examine their flank. 
Okay, so there's no trauma. Yeah. And the transverse processes are okay, although these transverse processes are a little difficult to see. I'm but, getting a little help from a friend over here who says maybe we should um, listen for a brewery. That's good. Why would you want to listen for a brewery? So that would, I guess, suggest turbulent flow um, that could be caused so, from. So if you have an acute onset of a dysrhythmia, it's classically a 50 or 60 year old person, they can present with an acute onset of AFib or some other weird dysrhythmia with a, a renal artery embolism. So that you need to be thinking about. So if you're having a problem with the kidney and there's problems, the most classic is gonna be obstruction from a stone or a stricture or semi-adrogenic disaster with the ureter that we get called for. But we also need to be thinking about obstruction of the vein and obstruction of the artery. That's the reason I wanted to put that in here. And so here you can sort of see that the right side is with a delayed type film, whether it be with the IV contrast with CT, with a delayed KUB, you don't see that and they have flank pain. If you don't see any excretion and you don't see a stone, you need to be very carefully, you need to carefully examine the vein and consider the artery and maybe do an ultrasound of arterial flow or get a stethoscope out and listen to their heart. That would give you more of a uh, uh, suggestion that you should do something else. And that's exactly what this is. And this is where I think I might have shown this one before, where you have the angiogram and you can see the cutoff of the renal artery here. Here you can see these are the lumbar vessels that when you get into some bleeding, that can be somewhat problematic. If you get into a lumbar vessel and you have difficulty controlling the bleeding, the key is first put pressure on it, going down into no man's land away from the great vessels. And then you do a figure of eight stitch and it will stop that bleeding. But you need to put a figure of eight stitch to stop that if you get into some lumbar vessels. In this situation, you can either use uh, TPA to dissolve uh, the clot, or you can go in there and try to pull it out with a Fogarty catheter. And if, you, if someone were gonna do a fellowship and IR that, we would call you up to do that kind of thing, but we don't have the capabilities of doing that. And here you can sort of see where it's clotted, now it's not clotted. So it's, it's a way to deal with it. Okay. So uh, here's a, a gentleman where if you look carefully, and I'll, I'll, I'll give this one to you without looking at it, I outlined something here, and that's most likely uh, a stone. Claire, are you there? I see you. All of a sudden, your face has popped up on my uh, a screen. Uh, what, do you, what do you see here, Claire? Uh, yes, I am here. Hi. Um, hello. Uh, so I'm seeing an x-ray. It's plain film. Um, so I think uh, just earlier your mouse was pointing to maybe some, some contrast um, or a foreign body. Um, so this is a scout radiograph. Yes, AP view. We're looking at part of the pelvis, lower spine. Um, it, it could be um, in the ureter um, based on the location. Um, so that could make it uh, to be a potential stone. It, it, it could be like a, a stent. Um, this little, I'm zooming into the picture here. I'm seeing like these little black dots all around it. So I'm not I, sure. I, I outlined that for you. I outlined that one for you. I wanted to make it very oh. obvious. Yeah. So that, oh, that they okay. didn't swallow anything bad there. Yeah. I see. Okay. So in that case, um, it, it could be an elongated stone in the distal ureter. And what's this? Um, what is that? Um, so if there's... So if this is like contrast that I'm seeing... Um, no contrast here. No contrast. There's no contrast? No contrast. Hmm. I'm not sure what that is. Um, what, 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 what lives there? You're, you're right on it here, Claire. So, it, it, what lives right there? Um, the aorta lives there. Okay, so, so the aorta comes on down. And bifurca the, the bifurcation of the aorta is a what landmark on the outside of the body? The umbilicus. Okay, so the belly button. Mm -hmm. So it probably bifurcates about right here, right? That's probably where the mm -hmm. belly button is. Yeah. And what happens around the belly button a lot? You can get aneurysms. You can get aneurysms. So usually that's from the aorta, not from the belly button. 
Yeah. yeah oh, right. a hernia? So, yeah, so it's an umbilical hernia. So that was the reason that we recently decided that we'll do an open ureteral lithotomy and repair the umbilical hernia at the same time. So when you think about different types of surgery, trying to do more open surgeries, it, hmm. it's nice to have something else to be able to do open surgery. If you were okay. to do open surgery, just tell me quickly, how, what would be your approach to, to get to the ureter? Um, the stone is quite large, but, um, you know, we could, we could try to manage this en endoscopically, especially with that, um, with that hernia. Well, you're going to repair the hernia anyway. So if you're going to repair the hernia, you can make an excuse to do it open, right? Or I guess, yeah. Open. But since, yeah. since I've never seen this do open, uh, stone surgery for, uh, ureteral stones, um, so I let's still say you're by, you're by yourself in the middle of nowhere and they don't have any scopes so they give you a knife say take the stone out what would you do there's no there are no scopes okay so in that case i guess i'm forced to do it open <laughs> you're gonna have a knife in mexico city yeah <laughs> okay yeah so i i guess I'm, I'm forced to do it open i mean um i think um since i'm doing the hernia at the same time uh we're i'm uh, we're gonna approach approach this um, transperitoneally, get to the retroperitoneum, find the the ureter, and get that stone out. I think you're supposed to cut right on top of the stone. Um, do 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 you cut this way or do you cut this way, transverse or longitudinal? I would cut lo lo longitudinally and then and then close transversely to avoid stricture of the ureter. So the reason you cut longitudinally, you don't act, you don't want to accidentally transect the ureter. One, two, mm -hmm. if you go transversely, this is pretty long, about two centimeters. So it's going to be hard to get that out through a transverse incision. Right. When you do cut on it, so you'll know whether you do it laparoscopically or whether you do it open. You use a twelve hook blade, and we have a special device that we use laparoscopically to do this where you actually put the 12 blade, because originally when I first did this laparoscopically, I put the blade in and tried to hold it with a forcep, and then the blade fell out of the forcep, and I'm looking oh for God. this blade in, in the peritoneal cavity. It was, it was not a fun endeavor. So I developed a little something that you could put a blade on, so it's a long handle with a blade that you have on it. And if mm -hmm. you put a 12 blade, you cut right on top of it, and then the stone doesn't come out. You know, it's pretty much adherent on the inside. And so then what you want to do is you want to get a nerve hook to sort of tease it out so you get it out in one piece. And then you want to just gently reapproximate the seromuscular layer there. But you, want, you don't want to do a Heineke Michelitz where you do it the other way because then you'll get a kink in the ureter. So you just uh -oh. want to gently, so you don't want to do that. Uh, because uh -huh. that would be like two centimeters pulling it together and you get these really funny dog ears and it wouldn't turn out well. Right, right. Yeah. So that's good to know. There's another use for the, the 12 blade. I feel like I've only seen it being used for meatotomy. So that, that's good to know that my 12 Yeah, so the 12 blade, blade is good. Situation. Right. So that would be an indication if we're looking for indications for doing this. Uh, if there's a concurrent hernia or some other kind of surgery that they want to do open. Uh, mm -hmm. if, you want, you, if you did it laparoscopically, you could probably repair this laparoscopically. And you could approach the stone laparoscopically also and do it in a similar fashion. Similar principles, put a vessel loop around it so it's not flopping around so that it makes it a little more still. Or you take another forcep to hold it with the stone and then cut on top of it, and that works out quite well. Okay? Okay. But if you, if you do have your scopes, you would still manage this endoscopically? Uh, yeah, I, mean, I, I think it would be difficult to do endoscopically such a big stone. I would probably approach this anagrade because there's obstruction and to be able to go down onto a big right. stone like that. To yeah, render yeah. them stone free, retrograde would be difficult because not only are you gonna have poor irrigation, but to pull all that stone out would be difficult. So I would go percutaneously, yeah. go down with a urethra right, yeah. and use a laser uh, to be able to get that all taken care of. Okay, all right, okay, thanks, Dr. Stoller. Okay, I, I, I brought this up and I wasn't sure if I've shown this one to you before. Uh, Max, have you seen this film? Uh, no, I, I don't think I have. It doesn't look super familiar to me. Okay, so tell me what you see here. Okay, um, well, again, I, it looks like you've kind of drawn on here with some ink. Uh, yeah, okay. I wanted to make it obvious. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, well, it's a, it's a plain film. It's an AP view of kind of the lower part of the spine. We see most of the lumbar or 
all of the lumbar vertebrae and then some of the pelvis. Uh -huh. um, it, it does show that there's what looks like a, a cystoscope in the bladder. Um, and then we have contrast up uh, both ureters into the both collecting systems bilaterally. Um, uh, and it looks like we did it, you know, uh, cystoscopically, so it would be a retrograde um, okay. pilogram. So um, what you've kind of indicated over on the left ureter uh, seems to be maybe a filling defect in the ureter. Uh, um, what, what would be your differential on the filling defect here? Sure, yeah. So it could be something that's obstructing, like a stone. Um, or, you, or Does the, the, the proximal area look obstructed? The calyces look obstructed? No, it does not. There's not a lot of hydronephrosis there. Um, and if anything, the ureter more proximally actually looks very thin um, right. w without much hydroureter going on either. Um, and even compared to the right side where we don't have the, the hand-drawn ink, um, you know, it, it, it is more collapsed, I would say, than the, than the right side. But um, so also on the differential would be, possibly be a malignancy of the ureter. Um, uh, so a mass or a tumor can lead to a filling defect. Um, and then uh, uh, if there's some sort of external compression, it can theoretically, I guess, you know, lead to a collapse of the ureter as well. Uh, where you so if you were, were going to deal with this, uh, with the urothelial carcinoma, would, what would you do? Uh, when you say deal with it? Um, uh, now they're coming to you uh, yeah. and there's a positive cytology and sure. uh, you see this filling defect here. What would you do? Yeah, um, I would go up with a ureteroscope and visualize it, I think. Um, okay, so let's just say we visualized it and it looks a sessile type of tumor in the ureter right above the iliac vessels. Mm -hmm. um, so at that point, you could, uh, can, can, would, you would want to get a biopsy um, uh, through the ureteroscope to get a tissue diagnosis and see whether it's low grade or high grade because um, that uh, okay, changes so your let's, management. Let's just sort of say it's high grade. Okay. Um, well, uh, so then uh, it, you can potentially just fulgurate um, the, the ureter and leave a stent. Um, and uh, if it's high grade, uh, it also depends on whether it's invading into, you know, the wall of the ureter or not uh, to kind of go down that, that pathway. Um, but uh, it ultimately, you'd also want to see, you know, kind of the upper tracks uh, better. I don't know if we have uh, other imaging and you want to do a good this all, this is all the imaging we get. In, okay. In, we're, we're in Mexico City again. Well, let's, we'll be in Brazil right now. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> they, they have your scopes down, down there as well, I think. Right. But, uh, <laughs> um, but, the, the, the thoughts at the time was that the, the tumor was too large with the ureter scope. They were concerned of a stricture like we recently had where someone tried to do something like this. And that it was a urothelial carcinoma and complete stricture with a long, long stricture. We ended up removing the kidney after that. Mm -hmm. And that probably would happen here. If you try to resect it, put it together, you'd probably get a stricture also. So the, the person here wanted to take the kidney and the ureter out. Is that a legitimate way of dealing with urothelial carcinoma? Yes. Okay. So this is what they did. So I, this is a take home message for everybody. So they took out the kidney, but they didn't take the whole ureter out. They left some of the, uh, the ureter behind. Was that a good move or a bad move? Uh, I would say that typically we'd want to take out the whole ureter. Okay. Uh, so if they left this in, they recognize, oh, I didn't go quite go far enough down what would you recommend that they do next? It, or, uh, well, we'd want to just make sure that there's no recurrence in the remnant ureter. Uh, of, yeah, of so the, 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 the specimen came back, there was no urothelial carcinoma there. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I mean, based on what we have now, I, I assume this is post-operatively, I see some clips there, and um, we're just looking up the left ureter, uh, right. probably just a surveillance retrograde uh, pilogram, or ureterogram, I guess, because there's no right. kidney left. Um, and there is now another filling defect. Um, that is it is, another one, or is it the same one? Well, actually, no, that's a good point. It's at the pelvic brim where the other one was, so I, I, I guess we kind of left it behind, didn't we? Right. Yeah. So what would you do now? Uh, you redirect me. Okay. So then he took him back to the operating room. And this is a take-home mess for everyone. You, I don't want this ever to happen to you guys. Okay. They took him back and they took out the distal ureter. So what do you see here? Uh, well, it looks like uh, there is a little bit more of the ureter that has been removed, but there's still some ureter there. Um, and most importantly, there appears to still be a... Uh, a mass there that's leading to what about it. what happened on the right side 
the the right side um well i don't see a yurter there <laughs> oh they took out the distal yurter but they did the wrong side interesting okay so now yeah. what they did is they took the left kidney out they didn't do a complete nephro uterectomy they recognized that there was a tumor left below so they took the distal yurter out but they took the wrong distal yurter out so now they refer them to me and now what would what would you do now when you're in charge uh, well, we could potentially auto transplant that that right kidney. Um, so this is actually the beginnings. This is the first auto transplant that I did uh, many years ago. And so what we did is we went in and did a distal ureterectomy. There was no choice but to do something on that other ureter. And so we hooked up the renal pelvis down to the pelvis down to the bladder, and we did that. So I just want to emphasize with this COVID nineteen out there that everything is a little different right now. But we as a group are ultimately responsible for doing the timeout, listening, and ensure that you do the correct side. That, that's my take home message here, is that we just don't want that uh, happening to us in those situations. Uh, you know, when you do these, if you, if you don't have confidence in doing the auto transplant, you could put in a bowel interposition all the way to the renal pelvis, all the way down to the bladder down here. Uh, and that would be another option that you could do. But uh, this is an unfortunate uh, situation where someone got uh, sort of confused. Uh, and when these kind of patients come to you, you just tell them the facts, don't make any judgments and say, okay, this is our options that we're gonna do to try to put you all back together. So uh, we're sort of running a little low on time here. I know people have a, a lot going on for the rest of the day. Uh, my emphasis on these kind of uh, uh, case uh, discussions is that it's exciting that we chose urology. It's exciting that there's a lot of new stuff uh, here. Common sense is very valuable, but also having a wide breadth of your differential will help you make these appropriate approaches as we go forward. So uh, thank you guys for all uh, joining in. Have a good day later today. And uh, I think we're going to be some, doing some more of these uh, conferences down the line. So have a good day. Take good care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you so Dr. much, Stoller. Dr. Stoller. I just want to make a comment for our viewers, uh, Dr. Stoller's comments on Mexico cities because Dr. De La Calle is from Mexico City and not disparaging our Latin American. No, no, no. no. Yeah, so thank you very much. There. Yeah, I was saying that from uh, <laughs> terms of endearment from our colleague from uh, either Paris or Mexico City, depending upon where we have to take a different time in her life. So, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I was yes. not making disparaging. <laughs> or Brazil. I love Brazil, too. So this is good. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I can confirm that. <laughs> okay. Thanks for the thanks for a great talk, Dr. Stoller. Okay, thanks, Claire. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day.